Well, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm really grateful f uh, for your time and uh, for in the middle of your week uh, pausing to do this study together. And uh, thank you, thank you for being here. Um, let me pray and then we'll dig into what we've got for tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for um, each person here. Thank you for um, their story that brings us together into this moment. Thank you for how you equip us, um, even through seasons that um, are difficult and heavy and hard to navigate, and we get weary and worried quickly. But you are a God of strength and peace, and we we need to each learn how to continue to trust you more. And I pray that in this place tonight that your peace would rule and reign, that this would be a place of refreshing and um, encouragement. This would be a place of safety, a place where we can place our trust fully in your care, that you would shepherd us tonight, that you would teach us, and that we would be more and more amazed at how you love each and every one of us. In your beautiful name we pray, amen. Tonight um, is week 70 of our series, and when we started, we started Mark 1, verse 1, and he begins the gospel this way. This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And we have not left that path for all of these sessions. And next week, we're going to take communion together as a class. And for those watching online, um, I would love for you to have something ready to take communion with us. Um, and uh, we're going to walk through the Last Supper and um, take communion together and, and um, participate in this new covenant and participate in um, all that communion represents for us. So we've been spending um, the last four weeks talking about um, preparing our hearts for next next Wednesday. And tonight, um, I want to insert in our study um, all the ways Jesus is the Passover lamb. And um, it won't be all the ways. Um, because as I'm pulling it together and studying the last couple of weeks, I had 33 pages of all the ways he's the Passover lamb. And we sometimes get through seven in a class. And, and what I want us to take from this is our God saw fit to give us details and prophecies and establish um, points of memory for generations to see that Jesus is the one Passover lamb, that there are so many clear point-to-point -point areas that point to Jesus as the Passover lamb, the only one, that you have to ignore mountains of details to question if he is not the only way to God. And I think the Lord provided this for us so that we would have such confidence and such hope that Jesus is the Passover lamb and that what he has accomplished is complete and perfect for every single one of us. And the more we look at him and the more we study the word and prophecies and what the Lord instituted with Passover, the clearer and more beautiful the picture should get. And I hope that it's worth um, pausing to look at this so that our hearts are um, filled with wonder when we take communion. <laughs> Just filled with awe that our God loves us and wants us so clearly and confidently to know that Jesus is the one that is the Passover lamb who takes away the sins of the world. 
We're going to point out areas of his plan. Um, I want us to consider um, our walk with God and how the confidence we have in that walk um, doesn't require us to squint our eyes to try to see Jesus. It doesn't require us to to stretch and uh, contort um, ideas and build bridges that aren't there. He is He has structured all of it for us from beginning to end to see that this one, Jesus, is the only way to God. And it's it is an important foundational truth for us in our walk because we've all felt the pressure of in culture or in our families that um, that exclusivity can be offensive. <laughs> There's only one way to God and it's Jesus. And we want to be a people um, aligned with the truth, submitted to God's hand, and have a confidence in that exclusivity. It's not, um, it's not a name your own adventure kind of eternal invitation. There's one invitation. There's one lamb. There's one sacrifice. There's one way. And from the very beginning of Mark, the good news is that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. There is this pronouncement right after Mark 1.1. 1, 1, we get this passage from Isaiah that is prophecy about John the Baptist. And then John the Baptist is the forerunner of Jesus. He's the one to announce this coming. And you remember when Jesus began his public ministry, he is... Um, approaching the Jordan River where John is baptizing. And when John sees him, um, he makes this, ex this pronouncement and this introduction. This is John 1, 29. The next day, he saw Jesus coming to him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the pronouncement from John, the prophetically sent as a forerunner to Jesus, um, this is just before he's baptized. And we notice that in this significant moment, this, the very beginning before he begins his public ministry, he is named the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb. In Passover, we've talked about it a couple times. It is one of seven feasts that God instituted, and he commanded the Israelites to participate in the fat Passover to remember their rescuing, their deliverance from slavery in Egypt. This is a requirement. The Passover is a requirement for Jews. If they are close enough to Jerusalem, they have to go there for the Passover. And Exodus 12 is the passage we're going to um, pivot on tonight, and I wanna, we'll read through that. This is when God instituted the first Passover. And the first Passover was the night that the Israelites were freed from slavery in Egypt. And on that night, God sent this tenth judgment or plague over Egypt. And it was this tenth plague of judgment that was the, the, the catalyst for starting the Passover feast. Um, the tenth and final judgment or plague of God would kill the firstborn of every household. And only the homes with the blood of the Passover lamb and the doorposts are passed over by God. This tenth plague and judgment would affect everyone. And um, we'll talk about why that is as we, as we move ahead. Um, this is... Uh, not a religious ceremony, and it's not a drill. <laughs> if the blood of the lamb is not on the doorpost, when God passed over the house, the firstborn would die. Egyptian or Israelite. 
everybody. And we'll talk about why as we move on. Um, so we need to think about um, the message they first received and look for the symbols and the, the hand of God in the details that lead us um, through most of what we're going to look at tonight. I want to read Exodus 12 over us and uh, um, just remember and receive. This is God starting the first Passover. The Lord God said to Moses and Aaron, in the land of Egypt, they're still in slavery. This month shall be the beginning of months for you. And we learned that that's the Hebrew month of Nisan. It is the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, they are each to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's households. A lamb for each household. Now if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one accordingly to the number of persons in them, accordingly to what each man should eat. You are to divide the lamb, and your lamb shall be an unblemished male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill the lamb at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that same night roasted with fire. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head and its legs, along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over until morning. Whatever is left of it um, in the morning you shall burn with fire. Now you shall eat it in this manner, even though you eat it is described by the Lord. With your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt, and on the night I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be assigned for you on the house where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land in Egypt. And we talked a couple weeks ago about how um, culture sometimes has added this idea of, you know, the angel of death. And um, we kind of get that extrapolated out into the Grim Reaper. And what the word says is it's God himself. I am the Lord. I will pass over. And he is bringing judgment, and it says that in um, verse 12, against all the gods of Egypt I execute judgment. And uh, it's an interesting study we might get to someday about all ten plagues were directly pointed to ten false gods of idols of Egypt. This is the last one. And this, this event that the Lord begins, um, he starts their calendar. It's the first day of their year. This is what your year is going to look like. He starts the timing and the sequence. He starts the, the meal. He gives them directions, one lamb per household. He talks about um, you bring the lamb into your house and keep it for four days. And then the lamb is killed. The whole assembly kills at twilight on the 14th of Nisan and roasted in fire and eaten in haste with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. All of that is direction from God that is pointing to the fulfillment of the judgment for all being paid in Jesus as the Passover lamb. So when we look at this in the first Passover, the very, very first one, a lamb is sacrificed in Exodus 12. And in this final Passover in Mark 14 that we're in the middle of studying, Jesus is sacrificed as the final Passover lamb. 
And the church is already aware of this revelation that Jesus is the Passover lamb. It's not something that um, was, we put together um, in recent centuries. When the church was first forming, um, one of the earliest letters we have is to the church in Corinth, the Corinthians. Um, Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Get rid of the old yeast by removing the wicked person from among you. Then you will be like a fresh branch batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us all. They were aware of his role as the final Passover lamb from the earliest gatherings of the church after the resurrection. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1.18, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. In the book of Hebrews, um, Hebrews describes the sacrificial work and the work of Christ as our Passover lamb. Hebrews 9, 12 through 14 says, And not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from the dead works so you can serve the living God. Jesus is the Passover lamb because he is the sacrificial offering without blemish. He is sinless, no blemish, there is no sin in him, and he is able to take guilt and sin away. Conscience can be cleared because of his work. The sacrifices that they would make year after year would atone, but they wouldn't clear. They could never pay for all the sin debt. So the, the center of Passover is a sacrificed lamb, and the center of the last Passover, what we're studying in Mark, is that Jesus is the Lamb of God. And this sacrifice is sufficient. And this is, this is uh, out of our comfort zone, because we never, I don't think many of us, grew up with a sacrificial system. I don't know where you went to church when you were little, but they probably didn't sacrifice anything, right? So this is... Um, this is weird for us, and we can sometimes read about sacrifice and study sacrifice, and it seems like it's such a um, a distant and kind of um, gross and uncomfortable thing. And I, and I think it's okay that it that it's gross and it's uncomfortable because the blood that is shed um, should not be looked at lightly. It is um, sobering and significant, and it costs tremendously. Um, it should adjust our thinking about sin. Sin isn't um, looked, God doesn't look at sin and um, say that, well, that's okay, it's okay. You're so sweet, it's okay. <laughs> sin is... Um, the source of suffering and death. And we can do nothing to pay that debt of sin. And the system of sacrifice could never be enough to cover the debt of sin. It was um, at the most temporary and it was not a full atonement and it was symbolic of what was to come. Hebrews 10, 1 through 14 says, For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come, this is just a shadow of what is to come, and not the very form of things, can never be the same sacrifices which are continually offered year after year when they go 
to the temple and make sacrifices. They cannot make people perfect. Otherwise, why would they not have ceased to offer because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sin? But in those sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins year after year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins, no matter how many years they did it. In verse 5, Hebrews 10, Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. And after saying the above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law, then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. And by this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. In the system of priesthood and sacrifices, every priest would stand daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which never could take away sin. And the repetition didn't pay the debt of sin, but Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sits down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. By one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And this thinking about his sacrifice should build our confidence in the cleansing work he's done in each of our lives. All of us um, can remember in our moments of rebellion against God when we've done things our own way done things that were just selfish or were just desires of our own to satisfy ourselves and we have gone our own way and sinned and we can um, we can stir up that guilt in ourselves again and the enemy of our soul would love for us to feel like maybe it wasn't enough for me. <laughs> you know, maybe it says that it's perfected for all those, but I don't feel that way. And I've said things or things have been done to me or I've just thought things and um, we can be ashamed about things that we don't want to talk about and it can hinder our experience of intimacy with God and it actually makes us um, in a weird way um, believe that our sin is too great for this one sacrifice. And all of us have felt that. And it's, and it's okay if you're wrestling with that. I want to encourage you to keep wrestling and push past that because that is the place where we should be astounded <laughs> that he has paid this price in perfection so that we could be cleansed, so that we could be made right with God. And the more aware we are that we don't deserve it, the more in awe we should be and the more motive we should have to worship him. We should be amazed that he offers us this perfect gift because we don't deserve it. Jesus is offered for us as a true, complete, and final sacrifice for sin. That's one of the ways he's the last Passover lamb. All of Exodus 12 that we read is focusing on the lamb. When the temple is destroyed by Rome in AD 70, the Jewish people um, stopped sacrificing lambs at Passover. They still do Passover 
They've added a lot to Passover, which is interesting, um, but that no lamb is sacrificed. And um, it, there's, uh, there's a lot of reasons um, culturally, politically, when they were in exile, um, they're divided and the, they couldn't gather together. They've lost the temple where they used to come together for Passover. Um, they've lost the rabbinic order of the high priest. All of the structure of their worship is gone. And um, for those in the Jewish culture and in faith, if they will pursue why, um, if you've ever watched any of the um, testimonies of like Jews for Jesus is one organization, the depth of um, the awe and wonder that I'm trying to talk about <laughs> just pours out of people who are so familiar with the Old Testament that, that they can see all these points connecting. And for him to be the final Passover lamb, and without their, their intention or desiring or anybody making a decision that they do not sacrifice a lamb anymore um, is another indicator <laughs> that it's not necessary. There are no more sacrifices because there's been one and it's been perfect. And the purpose of the lamb, the lamb is killed as an as a image for the whole family in this household that their sin cost something, that sin is a serious offense to God and it costs this lamb. And the lamb dies to avoid punishment for sin against the family. It takes the sin, it represents the family. When Jesus dies, he is a sacrifice for all the world to avoid the punishment of sin if they will receive him as Lord. He dies to take the judgment for all sin. When God said in Exodus 12, I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, I will strike down all the firstborns in the land of Egypt, man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. Egypt was full of idolatry. These ten main gods that the Lord judged with the ten plagues. Each plague was judgment against these false gods. Judgment for sin. The Israelites also needed the blood of the Lamb on their door because they would have been judged for this same sin. They had incorporated the Egyptian gods into their homes and into their their life. And um, they had been in slavery for over 400 years. And um, they had this mixture of Egyptian um, idols and uh, the Hebrew God and it was all kind of mixed together. And if they had not participated in the Passover, the judgment would have come upon their house too. This plague of judgment would have found the Israelites guilty it's interesting that the first nine plagues um, inconvenienced them and made them suffer, but there was no judgment against the Israelites until this tenth plague, that they would have a false god that they'd worship. And this is described, we, we know this, because of Ezekiel 20. Ezekiel 27, God is describing the Israelites uh, while they were in sin, in slavery to Egypt. Ezekiel 27 God is speaking. I said to them, cast away each of you the detestable things of his eyes. and Do not defile yourself with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Ezekiel 27. So the Passover lamb was to avoid the judgment of sin. And the cross of Jesus was for us to avoid the judgment of sin. He takes upon himself the sin of the world. And think about the blood of the lamb covers them during judgment and how the blood of Jesus covers us during the day of judgment. So there will be one day of judgment that we've talked about. And on that day, if we are covered in his blood, if we have placed faith in him, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It is just like the Passover. You are covered and protected by his blood. Exodus 12 
when the Lord lays out how the Passover is going to work, this first Passover, is 1,400 years before the, the week that we're studying, this last Passover week. In Matthew 26, verse 26, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. From the very first time this meal is changed, in the week that we're studying, but the bread is to symbolize his broken body and the drink was to symbolize his blood which was poured out for the forgiveness of sins. This is, um, this is one of the reasons it was hard for the Jews in the first century to think of a Messiah having to die. Um, even though they had the Passover, even though they had this ceremony and this festival that festival is the wrong word right but this they had this passover meal for 1400 years in the first century when jesus is speaking to the disciples they still can't quite imagine that the messiah should die they still think the messiah is going to be a political takeover and dying seems like losing <laughs> But for 1,400 years, God has set this example for them to remember how he rescued, to remember how the blood covered them from judgment, the blood protected them from judgment from sin. And when Jesus begins his ministry, John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This Messiah wasn't coming just to be a king for Israel. He came to be Messiah, a sacrifice for the whole world. Jesus is the sacrificial Passover lamb for the entire world. We have the picture of the original Passover when it's just for each household, and then Jesus, who is the Passover lamb for the whole world. John 1.29, Jesus is the Passover lamb for the whole world. Um, we have this reference in 1 Corinthians 15.22, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. And the imagery there of Jesus, all these points, I'm just, I'm just, it's all going to be the same point. We're all going to hit, he's the Passover lamb. <laughs> Adam is the first man. He is the the representation, the representative of all mankind. And the first man brings sin into the world. And through that first Adam, sin and death enter all of creation. Jesus, when he comes incarnate, he's fully God and he takes on flesh. He becomes, Scripture describes him as the second Adam. Now Jesus, the one who is pure and holy and sinless and spotless, can represent all of mankind because he has taken on the flesh of a man. And he, this second Adam, is now the sacrifice for the world, for all the sin of mankind. That he... In Adam, all die. In Christ, all are made alive. That this rescuing work of our God um, allows us to be rescued because he humbled himself and took the form of flesh like us. 1 Corinthians 15.45 says, So also it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life giving spirit. So if Adam is the first man, represents mankind, he is blemished. Like the lambs they would inspect, he is blemished and not sinless. Sin enters through him. But Jesus, representing all of mankind, is an unblemished lamb, spotless and sinless. He is the single sacrifice 
that pays our debt. So in Exodus 12, when God's describing their selection, they pick a lamb that is unblemished, a male that's a year old, and this unblemished lamb is the symbolism of being sinless. And um, in Hebrews 4.15, we have this description of our Jesus. Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things, just as we are, yet without sin. And we've talked about this before, how he was tempted in every way, but without blemish. No spot or sin on him. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold, um, from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of the Lamb, unblemished, spotless, the blood of Christ. You and I are not without blemish. You and I are not um, without spots. <laughs> but the lamb that we sacrifice needs to be. We need a sacrifice that is without blemish. We need Jesus. And when we receive Jesus, when God looks at us, you are not inspected for blemishes because the one who is without spot or blemish has been sacrificed for you. You can't clean yourself enough. <laughs> you can't do enough good things or be nice enough or kind enough. You can't get rid of the blemish of sin. We need a spotless lamb. And he has solved our greatest eternal problem. That in our blemished state, he himself has substituted himself to be the spotless lamb for you and for me. And how desperately we need him for that. He is perfect, sinless in every way. And you receive that gift. Jesus, in our study, we have seen, and we're going to see it in the next couple of weeks, is evaluated and tested and inspected. And it is just like God's direction to select a lamb that is without blemish. And you'll, you'll find moments where Jesus is inspected. There's um, one we'll look at when he's inspected by Pilate, and Pilate comes out, and if you remember, he says, I find no guilt in this man. Bob. What is an unblemished lamb? Yep. So ours is sin. So the symbolic unblemished lamb points to our blemish of sin. An unblemished lamb would be one that isn't a uh, cripple or miss physically, yeah. Um, and a one-year-old lamb, like for a, f it's for us, like we think, oh, it's a baby, right? <laughs> but a one-year-old lamb in a farming community is a full-featured, functioning lamb. Um, they can do everything a lamb needs to do for your farm, and so that lamb is in its prime of life. I don't know if that's the right way to say that. <laughs> The lamb is fully operational. <laughs> the prime of life is also a pointer to Jesus as the Passover lamb. He's, he's in his 30s. And you couldn't serve in the temple until you were 30. You couldn't be a priest until you are 30. When you're 30 in the first century, you finally have no social or political restrictions. Um, you can drive a donkey. Um, right, it's there's no. When you're younger than that, there's still limitations. He couldn't have been a priest in the temple, and the one-year-old lamb is the matured lamb that is ready to be fully engaged in lambing, shep shepherding. Right, um, not a baby. Um, 
not a teen, um, fully mature and in the prime of, of life. And it's another example that points to why he is, why he's the Passover lamb. Um, when, um, when we're growing up, um, the guys who've gone through Conquer with me, you know that uh, neurologists tell us that our brains, for men, the frontal lobe isn't fully formed until 27, 28 years old. And explains a lot of our choices when we're, because we, we're not ready, right? Um, there's something unique about when Jesus is 30, he is a fully matured, prime of his life man who is fully God, who has been tempted like a man and has never sinned. And his, the spotless part of him is the sinless part, not his physical appearance. or um, it, was, it was the heart of who he is. In Numbers 4.47 is the verse um, that describes you have to be 30 years old to be uh, in service in the temple. And after 50 years old, you could come and volunteer, but you're no longer like lead at the temple. So they had this window that Jesus was in the right age to be priest. Um, the lamb is selected even the day of the month. You know, he said this is the first day of, of your year. This is the first month, and the 10th of this month is when you're going to select your lamb. And we talked about how that is the day Jesus enters Jerusalem on the 10th of Nisan. So on Lamb Selection Day, Jesus enters. The crowds are singing Hosanna, and they're singing Psalm 118. And Jesus arrives on that day, and the crowds are still declaring that he could be king. But, Je but Jesus is coming knowing that God has declared him to be Lamb. He has selected this Passover week is the week that he, on his authority, will lay his life down. He's chosen this Passover to be the Passover lamb. When the family would select their lamb, they'd keep it in the home from the 10th to the 14th. And um, part of this time is the examination of the lamb. And part of this time is for the entire family and think about um, if you've got kids, especially little kids, think about that week with a lamb living in your house. Um, this is all imagery of examination of that parallels the examination the Sanhedrin put on Jesus, the, the times they came and tried to trick him with questions to get him to mess up and... Um, he passed all these tests. Um, he's put through a corrupt trial, and they go out looking for false witnesses to bring these false executions against him. Uh, Matthew twenty six fifty nine. The chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus, so they might put him to death. They did not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. Um, they couldn't find a blemish on Jesus. So they tried to fabricate one so that they could hand him off to be executed by Rome. But Jesus has said that no one takes my life from me. I lay it down on my authority. He is submitting himself, surrendering himself to be the Lamb of God. John 19 is where Pilate came out. Pilate said, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. This imagery is just like the lamb selection day. They've inspected him. He's without blemish, um, found faultless, and he's a male. And in that culture, the family line was traced through men. And it was a male lamb that was selected for Passover in the prime of its life without any physical defect. 
And Jesus is the male that is selected, um, and he's without any sin defect for us. Um, it is a serious requirement um, in the Passover that the firstborn belongs to God. And Exodus 12 sets up the Passover, and then God continues to describe um, their debt to him and how serious this is going into Exodus 13, verse 11. When the Lord brings you to the land of the Canaanite, as he swore to you and your fathers and gives it to you, this is all bef all as they're being freed, you shall devote to the Lord the first offspring of every womb, the first offspring of every beast that you own. The males belong to the Lord. Every first offspring of the donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And this is this is hard for us because we don't we're not raising animals. Um, and this burden of the first belongs to God. Um, verse thirteen, Exodus thirteen. Every first born offspring of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb but if you do not redeem it then you shall break its neck and every firstborn man among you your sons shall redeem so this is a, a serious requirement of the israelites every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem and it's another picture of god preparing us to see that he is giving his firstborn son, his only begotten son, um, that over and over Israel would see that the firstborn belongs to God. And for 1,400 years, this Passover lamb is a male, and, and Jesus is the son in the prime of his life that is the son of God. He has been selected for this point of redemption story. Um, why would God do this? <laughs> Why would God set this um, system up for them to participate in for 1,400 years? And he tells us why. Exodus 13, verse 14. And it shall be when your sons ask you in times to come, what is this? Then you'll say to them, with the powerful hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. It came about when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go that the Lord killed every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrificed to the Lord the males, the first of offspring of every womb, but every firstborn of my sons I redeem. This is to remember for 1,400 years, all the way back to that night in Egypt when they are rescued for that first Passover, and even for them to remember the rescuing of Isaac on the altar. That Abraham's son, when he was bound and on the altar, was rescued when God provided a lamb. Long before the Exodus. <laughs> that God from the beginning has been giving us this imagery that we might not miss it. That we would see that Jesus is the Passover lamb, the perfect one, the only one given by God. Another instruction that God gave in Exodus 12 is that when you sacrifice the lamb, you don't break any bones, don't break its legs. And um, it's, we've talked often about why would we be given this detail? Why, why does that detail matter? And when Jesus is being crucified, the Jews um, rabbinically had been writing um, and they felt that if a body was left on a cross overnight, it would curse the land. So they would ask the Romans to speed up this execution so the bodies could be taken down and not be on the cross overnight. And the way they would do it is this brutal... I tried to practice the name of the tool, and I can't say it. Um, I'll mispronounce it. Any, so this wooden thing, they would put in between the legs of the people being executed, and they would hammer it, and it would break their legs. And the problem, the struggle, now the crucifixion is just brutal, brutal execution. And as they're on the cross, outstretched, it's easy to breathe in, but very difficult to exhale. Um, shoulders are raised, and the lungs are spread, and the weight of the body, it's hard to exhale. And to exhale, they'd have to push up and exhale, and then 
breathe. And so when they broke their legs, they could no longer push up and they would, they would suffocate on the cross. And we have this detail 1,400 years before when the Lord says, don't break any of its bones, the Passover lamb. In John 19.32, the soldiers came and they broke the legs of the first man and the other who were crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. And they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen his, this testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you also may believe. These things came to pass to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Even that detail of how he died is another indicator that God wanted us to see this is the Passover lamb. And I want to um, just end with this idea of the Passover lamb. They were specifically instructed in Exodus 12 that every household should gather a lamb. And if you had a neighbor that um, was alone, you'd bring them in. So whoever gathered together, um, each household was to select one lamb. And there's this um, beautiful imagery, both of um, the household was covered together and of the doorway. So when the household gathered together, that one lamb covered them from the judgment. And the blood of that lamb was placed on the door of the house. And when the Lord passed over that house, everyone in the household was spared. There was no judgment that took the firstborn. That household was covered by the blood of the lamb. Ephesians 2.16 says, and They might recognize, reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, the Jew and the Gentile, by it having put to death the enmity between the two. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access to one spirit, to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and you are of God's household. That the sacrificial lamb of God is the one that covers the entire household of God. That for the Passover, every single house had its own lamb. But when Jesus is sacrificed, he is starting a new family, including us. The household of God covered by his blood. First John 3 says, See how great the love the Father has that we should be called children of God. When they sacrificed the lamb, they were to take the blood and dip hyssop and put it on the doorposts and the lintel of their house. And I also think about the physical covering of blood on the door. And their instruction was to go through that door and remain in that household until the Lord passed over. And if that door was covered with the blood of, G of the lamb, they would be spared from judgment. Jesus, in John 10, 9, says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he'll be saved. He'll go in and out and find pasture. I think this is the imagery that we're not supposed to miss. <laughs> that the only way to get safety on the night of the first Passover was to go through the door with the blood of the lamb and to stay in there, to remain in the household. And Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. This last Passover with Jesus as the door, marking the blood for us to enter through, um, is this place of invitation for the world that you all 
can be part of the household of God. And that when the day of judgment comes, everyone who has gone through the door and is in the household of God is covered. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It is the invitation. It is the exclusive single way to God the Father. And it is available to all who would enter in. There, there should be, um, I hope, great confidence in this invitation that um, that blood protects us from the judgment of sin. And we need it. We need a spotless, blemish-free lamb to cover us. And that's who Jesus is for us. Are there questions or other ideas that you've thought about? What I find really interesting <coughs> is uh, maybe a non believer standpoint when it comes to um, this object of authority that we see in our faith. Um, and usually the rebuttals are more uh, moral. seems like there's never a rebuttal towards like that. It seems like it's an objective morality that they're referring to based on how they're feeling at that moment versus this cultural context of completely missing. Yep. Really yeah. We don't, in the culture, um, we're making generalizations, but there's um, much of the culture that is even offended by the idea that there is sin. And if there isn't sin, there's no need for a payment. And it, and it seems odd and uh, um, Sometimes when I talk to people, it's, they're very frustrated that it doesn't make sense that someone had to die. Um, and it's because we don't understand sin. We don't see sin as uh, an offense to God or a problem even. <laughs> um, we actually... Um, Culture actually celebrates and is proud of sin. And that's why we feel that tension. Um, and uh, I think even when the, uh, the Israelites were taken away to Babylon, or Babylon yep. and, and they, they had to be subject to their culture and their ways of thinking, and it was a very, very odd thing to them. wasn't a good idea to completely uh, conform to that culture. It wasn't necessarily a, a good thing to completely isolate yourself from that culture either, but it was, uh, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, they had, um, we experienced that too. We, you can't isolate when my little girls were little, um, I was really tempted to, it'd be fun just to move to Montana and just protect their little hearts and their eyes and their ears. And have you all felt that? Yeah. But I'm not equipping them to be, I had two girls, to be women that um, their hearts are guarded and their minds are guarded by Christ. Um, they've got to be part of culture. And if we're not, we can't be a light in the world. Um, and we aren't against culture. Um, we're just not going to compromise God for culture. And there's no one that God hates. And um, God just cannot um, compromise 
his holiness to sin. So when we're in culture, it's part of why we need each other. We need community to be reminded of the truth of God's word. Um, it is a deceptive path when culture wants everybody to have their own truth. Um, we need community to talk about the word like we do because all of our personal experiences are completely different. Even if I know some of your story and you know some of mine, um, none of us know the weight of our personal experience. And all of our spiritual formation, our Bible reading and prayer, our experience spiritually, it's all different. Um, maybe you grew up at different types of churches. Maybe you never went to church when you were growing up. And all those, the personal experience and the spiritual life, different. But community has this foundation of this is the word. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And he's going to be Savior and Messiah. And one day he will return as judge. <laughs> and his opinion only will matter in the end. And in a loving, gentle way, we need to be people of confident faith that doesn't compromise the Passover lamb and the work that he did. It is, uh, it is a work that needs the Holy Spirit for sure because it's um, difficult every day. So. You talked about um, in Exodus where you said um, that the firstborn, I mean after the Exodus, the firstborn of the household of man and animal belong to, to the Lord. Yep. Do we have a specific job? them? I mean, did they, does that mean they go into the priesthood or? No. Um, redeemed of the Lord, like dedicated to the Lord. Um, some some might go into priesthood. That's where we get um, like the Nazarite vows, like uh, when Hannah um, had Samuel. Um, she'd prayed for that first born and then she dedicated him to the Lord. Um, Samson was a Nazarite vow um, from his mom. Um, it was a um, it was a reminder that their firstborn had been spared. So the firstborn son was spared at the Passover. So from then on, that firstborn was redeemed for the Lord. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. They didn't give. They didn't have a specific job, or right. It was the um, the, the acknowledgement that without the redemptive work of God, the firstborn would have been taken in judgment. But they've been redeemed. Well, that makes us special. You are all special. Yep. <laughs> yep. Let me pray. I'll talk about anything you want. I'm so thankful for your time tonight, Father. Thank you for your word. And thank you for Jesus, our Passover lamb. Thank you that one who is without sin willfully and sacrificially substituted himself for all of our sin. May we ponder this and wonder, and may we be in awe that we're loved the way we are. May it cause us to love our neighbors and our family. May it cause us to have grace and mercy with those who are um, difficult in our story and to have compassion for those who are walking in ways that uh, lead them into suffering and ways away from you. May we be a people of invitation, a people um, who point to Jesus as the only hope for all eternity. Be with each family here, each person here. I pray that you would Bless them tonight with a peaceful sleep as a gift from you, a provision from you. Reminder that you never slumber, but we need rest. And that you are one who gives peace and rest. And during that time, Father, may we just um, trust you in our sleep and rise tomorrow to be a light in our city, to be 
the voice of encouragement and hope to people around us who are suffering and fearful. And may they be an encouragement to one another to lift you high in all that we do. In your name we pray. Amen. Next week, communion. And uh, looking forward to gathering in at the table together. So thank you all for coming. <laughs>